Welcome to this lecture, we'll discuss the differences and similarities between the one sample t-test and the confidence interval. To understand this lecture, I recommend that you first watch the video about the t-distribution where we discussed how to create confidence intervals based on the t-distribution, as well as the lecture about the one sample t-test. To explain the difference between the one sample t-test and confidence intervals, we'll here have a look at a simple example. Let's say that we would like to investigate the effect of a new diet. We recruit six random individuals from the population of interest that test the new diet for four weeks. The first person gained two kilos after the diet, and the second person gained one kilo, whereas the third person lost three kilos, and so forth. Remember from the lecture about the one sample t-test that we used the following formula to calculate the t-statistic. And from the video about the t-distribution, we know that we should use the following formula to calculate the confidence interval if our sample size is small and when the population standard deviation is unknown. To calculate the confidence interval and the t-statistic, we first need to calculate x-bar, which represents the mean of our sample. The mean change of the weights is negative 0.5 which means that the average weight loss was 0.5 kilos for the six individuals. The mean weight loss gives us the value of x bar. Next, we calculate the standard error of the mean. Remember from the lecture about the standard error that it is calculated by dividing the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. Since we do not know the population standard deviation, we need to estimate the standard deviation based on our sample. I have here already calculated the sample standard deviation to about 1.87. Watch the lecture about the standard deviation to see how this is calculated. Since we have observed the weight change of 6 individuals, our sample size is equal to 6. If you do the math, we see that the standard error is equal to about 0 0.763. We now need to determine the value of mu0 which is our hypothesized or reference value. This is the value that we like to compare with. We therefore set mu0 zero to 0 so that we can compare to the case where the diet has no effect, which means that the average weight of the six individuals will not change. Note that mu0 zero is not included in the formula for calculating the confidence interval. In contrast, the formula requires that we extract the t-score from the t-distribution. The t-distribution looks like this. The formula tells us that we should use a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Since our sample size n is 6, we use a t-distribution with 5 degrees of freedom. Since we like to generate a 95% confidence interval, the value of alpha is equal to 0 0.05, because 1 minus 0 0.95 is equal to 0 0.05. 0 0.05 divided by 2 is equal to 0 0.025. We should therefore extract the t-score from this t-distribution that defines the edge of the upper tail that covers 2.5%. If we extract this value from the t-distribution by using a software, we see that this value is about 2.571. We now have everything that we need to calculate both the t-statistic and the confidence interval. We plug in the mean value, the standard error, the value of mu0, and the t-score. If you do the math, the t-statistic is calculated to about negative 0 0.655. And if we calculate the 95% confidence interval, we see that it goes from about negative 2.462 and positive 1.462. We'll now have a look at the differences in how to interpret the calculated confidence interval and the t-statistic. Remember that the critical values from the t-distribution with 5 degrees of freedom are negative 2.571 and positive 2.571. Recall that we use this value when we calculated the confidence interval. When the t-statistic is located between these critical values, then we know that the corresponding p-value is bigger than 0 0.05, which means that we can draw the conclusion that the diet has no significant effect.
and when we interpret the confidence interval, we check if the interval includes the value of mu zero, which is equal to zero in our example. Since zero is included in this interval, it is considered as a reasonable value. If a mean weight change of zero is reasonable, this means that we can draw the conclusion that the diet has no significant effect. We'll come to the exact same conclusion when we check if the t-statistic is within this interval, as if the value of mu zero is within the confidence interval. Thus, we can use either a confidence interval or one sample t-test to check if our sample mean is significantly different from a certain reference value or a hypothesized value. We'll now look at the similarity between the confidence interval and the one sample t-test. When we calculate the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval, we subtract the critical value times the standard error from the sample mean. And when we calculate the upper bound, we simply add the critical values times the standard error to the mean. The confidence interval can therefore be defined like this, which shows the calculations for the lower and upper bound. Similarly, we can formulate the one sample t-test as if we check if the t-statistic is within the bounds defined by the critical values negative 2.571 and positive 2.571 taken from the t-distribution. If the t-statistic is between negative 2.571 and positive 2.571, we would draw the conclusion that the diet has no significant effect. If the t-statistic is within these bounds, we also know that the p-value would be larger than 0.05. We therefore check if the t-statistic is within or outside this interval when we use a one-sample t-test. In summary, when we use a confidence interval, we check if the reference value, the hypothesized value, is inside or outside the bounds of the confidence interval. Whereas for a one sample t test, we check if the t statistic is inside or outside the bounds of the critical values, or if the computed p value is larger or less than 0 0.05. We'll now have a look at another example where one would like to know if people with a certain disease have a higher or lower systolic blood pressure compared to the general population, which has a mean systolic blood pressure of 120. The value mu zero is therefore the value that we like to compare with, which can be seen as our reference value. We recruit eight random individuals with a specific disease and measure their upper blood pressure. The mean systolic blood pressure of these eight individuals is 123.5. Note that this value is a bit higher than the reference value of 120, which indicates that people with the disease have, on average, a higher systolic blood pressure than the general population. However, is this difference due to chance, or do people with the disease actually have a higher systolic blood pressure? To answer this question, we can use either a confidence interval or a one sample t test. We'll here compute both. Based on the eight blood pressure values, I have here calculated the standard error of the mean to 1.4. Since we have blood pressure values from eight individuals, we'll use the t distribution with seven degrees of freedom. The critical value from the t distribution with seven degrees of freedom, and by using an alpha value of 0.05, corresponds to about 2.36. Note that this value is a bit smaller compared to our previous example because the sample size is here bigger. We then simply plug in our values and compute the 95% confidence interval. If you do the math, we see that the confidence interval goes from about 128.2 to 126.8. Note that this interval does not include the reference value 120 since the lower bound of the confidence interval is 120.2. 120 is therefore not a reasonable value according to the interval. We can therefore conclude that the mean systolic blood pressure for people with the disease is significantly greater than 120. We will now compute the one sample t-test. We plug in the values for the sample mean 
the reference value, and the standard error. We see that the t-statistic is 2.5, which is outside the range between the critical values. Since the t-statistic is not within the region defined by the critical values negative 2.36 and positive 2.36, we'll draw the same conclusion as we did for the confidence interval. Based on our confidence interval, or the one sample t-test, we can therefore draw the conclusion that people with the disease have, on average, a significantly higher systolic blood pressure compared to the general population. Our best estimate for the mean systolic blood pressure of this group is 123.5, and we are 95% certain that the true population mean value of the systolic blood pressure for people with this disease lies somewhere between 120.2 and 126.8. Also, based on the T statistic, we can use the software to calculate the area to the left hand side of negative 2.5 and to the right hand side of positive 2.5. The total area of these two tails covers approximately 4%, which represents our p-value. Since the p-value is 0.04, which is less than 0.05, we will draw the same conclusion as before. To summarize, we will come to the same conclusion when we check if the p-value from a two-tailed one-sample t-test is less than 0.05, as if we would check if the hypothesized value lies outside the 95% confidence interval. This was the end of this lecture about the differences between the one sample t-test and confidence intervals. In the next lecture we will discuss the methodology of a hypothesis testing.